Hi guys, this is Claire and welcome back to Subjectively. Today's video is going to be a little bit more casual than usual. I'm going to be going over my process as a digital painter and touching on some tools and techniques that I use in my everyday mark making. But before we get into that, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Inked Gaming. Inked Gaming produces high quality custom TCG board game and tabletop merchandise. Their products feature the work of tons of independent artists such as myself, or if you can't find a design you like, you can upload your own image to create a one-of-a-kind playmat or mousepad. Check them out with the link below, and be sure to use the offer code SUBJECTIVELY10 for 10% off your entire order at checkout. Now let's dive in. So like I said, this video is going to be a little bit more casual than normal. This video exists less as an art lesson and more as a this is how I make things, I think it's kind of neat sort of thing. For this demo, my subject is going to be my dog Pinko. One, because she's cute and I love her, but also secondarily because a lot of my freelance work is doing pet portraits, so painting animals is kind of a comfort zone for me. Unlike many of those commissions though, I'm not quite going to be doing the 100% realism thing since this video is more about my personal style and artistic taste. If a digital realism tutorial video is something you guys might eventually be interested in, please let me know in the comments. A lot of people ask me what the difference between an illustrator and a painter is. Depending on who you talk to, you can get a lot of different answers. Some people say snooty things like that an illustrator simply shows you a concept while a painter makes you question a concept, or like an illustrator has a job and a painter does not. I feel like all of these reasons to separate painter and illustrator are kind of bogus. An illustrator can also be a painter and vice versa. There's obviously a lot of overlap in skills. For me, I just like using the label painting for my work because my process feels more like painting than like drawing. When I work with my tablet, it still feels similar to my art process when using real life oils. I usually don't have a sketch layer and I kind of build up my piece with blocks of light and color all at once instead of separating each step into categories of line, light, shadow, etc. I also usually only use one layer for the entire file, which I like doing because it makes me feel more present in the painting, and it's easier for me to think about how my colors and values are interacting on the canvas. Now obviously, since we're talking about my digital process, there are some pretty clear advantages digital has over traditional work. For one, color mixing is so much easier. You just click the color you want from that little box. It really can't get much easier than that. When I would sit and paint in my studio, like half of my work time ended up being dedicated to mixing the right color. Spending all that time mixing and thinking about the physicality of the paint was actually really meditative and kind of spiritual for me, but that setup was definitely not ideal for producing a lot of work quickly, especially when you factor in the cleanup time afterwards. Undoing and erasing is also obviously much easier, but I personally try to avoid erasing too much. This is another component of my process that I think makes it more painterly. When something doesn't look right, I usually just paint over it. Some of the best art advice I ever got was that no part of my art was precious. Basically, no part of my art should ever be safe from redo. I often find that the parts of a work in progress that I like best are actually what's throwing the rest of a painting off. It's kind of like that saying, if you love them, set them free. My general art philosophy is kind of like that, but more, even if you love it, you must still send it to the shadow realm as necessary. Um, uh, kind of. I'll actually include a picture of another version of this piece that I dropped completely when I realized it was literally the exact same composition as a different commission I did earlier this month. I really liked how that version was coming along too, especially the mark making on Panko's Brindo swirly pattern, which we call her Rosengon. But if I had kept going on that piece, it would have been way too boringly similar to my other work, 
so I made the decision to start fresh. It's definitely hard to make that call sometimes, especially because I've noticed another pattern in my art process. My feelings toward a piece over the course of its completion tend to pretty consistently follow a bell curve of, wow, I love this, to, oh my god, I ruined it. Back to a, wait a minute, this is actually pretty great. I think this is something a lot of artists have to fight through. And though it's hard sometimes, I do think it makes the final result that much more satisfying. Backtracking a little bit to my digital tools, there is one Photoshop tool in particular that I want to talk about because I think it's often a pretty big part of my digital process. You've probably already noticed me using it, but I'm talking about the Curves tool. The Curves tool is usually used to adjust and boost contrast. When you manipulate tones using that little wavy line, you have a lot more control over your lights and darks than you do with the normal contrast sliding bar. Generally, you would make a little S curve like this, which would make your lights lighter and your darks darker. If you've ever used the auto enhance feature on an iPhone, it's basically just automatically putting your image through an S curve. In my art, I use it a little bit differently. I like weirdly manipulating my tones halfway through a piece because it really makes me think twice about my color and value decisions. If the Curves tool has warped an area of shadow, I really need to be confident about whether or not I need to bring the shadows back into that zone, or if the values are better left alone. In other words, I have to think intentionally about my marks. I've heard of other artists trying to achieve similar effects by painting underneath a texture layer or things like that, but I like messing with my work's curves because I think it can also add an extra layer of depth to my palette. On the topic of mark making, I think that's another component of my personal style that's really integral to its overall look. From my real life painting experience, I realized I really like the look of paint on canvas. So I use a lot of Photoshop brushes that mimic that texture. Though I do experiment with different brushes pretty regularly, I know in general that my favorite brushes sample real life paint. Some new brushes I'm experimenting with right now are actually basically just brush mark stamps. I've never used anything like that until this month and I'm still trying to get a feel for them, but I do like them so far. They really remind me of putting paint on a palette knife and scraping it across a canvas because it produces that same kind of partially out of control mark that's a little bit different every time you do it, but using them is also definitely not as satisfying as the kinetic motion of using a palette knife. I, I don't know, I'm still figuring them out. I think aside from the specific marks, I pretty much just try to follow the same rules as everyone else when I paint. I try to be sensitive to areas of shadow and areas of light, where the lightest dark still needs to be darker than the darkest light. Panko's fur pattern is probably actually not the best for this demo since her fur has so much light and dark all in one place, but hindsight is 2020, and hopefully you get the point anyway. I also try using reflective light smartly in my paintings because I think reflective light done well really gives art that extra pop. In my reference photo, Panko's bright red color generated some pretty awesome reflective light on her magnificent jowls, so that was kind of a fun challenge to paint out. I definitely used a little artistic license to intensify the luminosity there, but I think the energy of the color palette matches the energy of the subject. Also, since I didn't really want to paint out a whole background, I just slapped down some warm colors and put in that circular yellow relief to add a little extra contrast to her face. That yellow circle also felt really right because Panko's also been pretty consistently waking me up as the sun rises for early morning walkies. So I think I've touched on all the most important aspects of my process, except for color. I build up color in my paintings at the same time as my lights and shadows. I think I tend to lean towards realistic colors, but with some fantastical elements. In general, you can do whatever you want with color, so long as your values are still clear enough to describe your subject. That's pretty much my process. Please let me know if you have any questions about, about anything I didn't talk about. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, be sure to share it with a friend. Also, be sure to subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one. Thanks so much, and have a great week.